Okay, Brian. Okay, this is the first lecture in a series of lectures which are intended to give you some background on using the SEM. This will be accompanied by a series of labs. I believe there will probably be five plus however many it takes you to become qualified to run it on your own. Those are practice sessions. Um, so we've got a combination of both these lectures on the theory of the operation and the laboratory lectures which are on the practical operation. My name is Eric Kwam. My office is in 2323 Armstrong. It's usually good to try to contact me, although if I'm in my office that means I'm available and I'm usually in my office. But if you need email contact, um, kvam at purdue.edu. So, <clears throat> for theory and background, you are welcome to see me, not just during the course, but at any time. I am not totally aware of all of the specific buttons and knobs and operations of all the SEMs on campus, but there is always a lab technician available to do that until you get your, your pilot's license, as it were. And that's what this course is to do, is to give you that. Until you get that, you will not be able to have access to the microscope unless a lab technician or teaching assistant who's fully familiar with those controls is available anyway. So it will be easier to go to a lab technician, a staff scientist, or whatever, than it will be to find me in any case. And they can give you an answer even though I likely can't. So if you're trying to figure out how something works in a more generic sense, I. I will always be happy to talk to you. If you want a specific thing, then you'll need to talk to the lab tech. Are there any generic questions about, general questions about the class? No. Okay. One of the things that we have to be aware of in terms of the background, in terms of what we're thinking about, are what you're trying to develop is resolution and contrast in your pictures. You need enough resolution and enough contrast to be able to see what it is that you want to see. So in the practical part you're going to learn about things like focusing and stigmation and so on. I'll talk about those generically here. But what I'm going to do through this series of lectures is talk about this part, this aspect of it, much more than twiddle this knob, turn this dial, push this button.
Part of the reason I won't talk about those individual things is that I want you to understand what you're doing and why. And part of the reason I won't talk about them is that there are, depending on which microscope you happen to be using at any particular time, probably over a dozen different individual things that you could adjust. And if you know what you're trying to do in a deeper way, you'll have a better choice of which ones you want to attack than if you just try to look up in a lab manual which one will affect this. Right? There, there are too many to try to memorize this does this, this does this, this does this, this does this without a lot of practice. But if you have an idea why you're doing what you're doing, it makes it easier to get to the right control operations. Sit down. One of the things that you have to be aware of is that magnification and resolution, you remember I said that resolution is one of these two main things you have to worry about. Magnification is not resolution. Resolution is whether or not you can separate two distinct objects. And so a resolution resolution is going to be a distance. Resolution is going to be a distance. It's how far apart two things have to be for you to be able to see them separately. And I hope, yeah, that works, that this will be a good example of resolution and contrast. How many of you can resolve both pairs of objects? How many of you can resolve both pairs of objects? Most of you probably can't see those two because they have a problem with contrast. If you look very carefully, you can probably see that they're there. But with poor contrast, you can't resolve them. They're the same spacing, maybe slightly farther apart than those two objects. Now, I haven't done it in this case, but one of the things that I could have done as part of this demonstration, is to make one of those small lines actually be a pair of lines. Some of you have seen this before, right? If one of those lines was a pair of lines, very, very tightly spaced, you wouldn't know that it was a pair of lines for a couple of reasons. One is that you can't see something that close together. The other is that the camera might not be able to pick them up. So, with the SEM, we have something funny going on that we don't in conventional microscopy. In optical microscopy,
you can see the entire object all at once. In the SEM, <coughs> what you're seeing is not the entire object, even when you're looking at the final image. What you're seeing at any time, including in the final image, is just a collection of individual points from the object. You're used to seeing the whole image at once when you're looking at, for example, the, this video. You're seeing something different. This video is taken point by point. It looks like you're seeing the whole object at once, but that's because the points are being refreshed very, very fast. You'll see when you get to the SEM, especially when you get in regions where you have low signal, you will see how the screen produces the image point by point. You won't see it down to the individual points, but what you'll see is that on the screen, you'll see it drawing lines one at a time. right? And each of these lines is actually made up of a series of points. And so what we've got in the SEM is that there are There are two different resolution limits in the SEM. There's a fundamental limit and I'll call this RSP for the resolution at the specimen itself. And there's a resolu resolution limit in the picture you're taking. And I'll call this RPCT. See, I keep getting f closer and closer to the right edge of the to the right edge of the. Limit. So, in the specimen itself, what are we going to do? On the specimen itself, we have. electron beam coming down. People like to make electrons green, so I'll make these green. We have a focused beam of electrons, which is coming down to some area no matter how well you focus it, there's going to be a limit to how much, how small that area can be made. And so there's going to be a final spot diameter. I'll call that D spot. Then the focus.
fundamental limit is going to be related to that spot size. How is it going to be related? Think about it for just a second. Let's go back to this first. You need to be able to separate two objects. Right? So, if I have a specimen here with an object here and an object here, That means that I need to be able to fit D spot into that space while not hitting this one or this one. Those have to be three separate spot spacings. That means in here I have to have a factor of two. Right. To be able to see them separately, I need to be able to fit the spot in between them without catching either of them. So as small as you can make your spot, twice that is your, going to be your fundamental resolution limit. Now, of course, we've got a second limit which is what you're going to do when you take the picture. So the resolution in the picture depends upon the fact that we're taking the image as a collection of points, right? We've got this. Let me resketch that. So here is my view. And I've got lines that are going across like this. Right. And each of those is in a single point, and the points are all equally spaced down each line. So I can draw these as columns of points. And if I just, to give it a name, I'll call it the point spacing. The spacing of the line and the spacing of the point give us what's called a pixel size. And a picture is, is um, old time geek shorthand for a picture element. So each spot is referred to as a pixel picture element. Now, if we go back to the resolution limit problem, what we've got here, what we've got here to the 
resolution in a picture. And again, if I have an object there in that pixel, and an object there in the next pixel, if I blow that up, what that will look like is that. If I have, let me go a little bit further down, another pixel there, remember the, the pixel doesn't come out with sort of the center dark and the rest of it light, right? That's not how it comes out. It's all dark or it's all light or it's all at whatever particular gray level we pick. pixel can't be subdivided into light and dark. If we keep the objects one pixel apart, now we can see them separately. So we're in the same sort of situation as we were in putting the beam down onto the surface. Here, of course, magnification comes in. So the actual size of the pixel The actual size of the pixel is not, of course, your resolution. The actual size, uh, the actual resolution depends on what the pixel spacing at the specimen was. If we have picture that's 10 centimeters across. I'll call 1024 is a pretty common pixel density, a 1024 by 1024 digital image. Many of you have done that. How many of you have done no, how many of you know the number of pixels across an object in at least one case? Not too many people practice this yet. Okay. You'll get to know this one. So let's suppose that we take it as a, as a one megapixel image. Right, that's what this is. That's 10 to the minus 2 meters over 1,000. means that on your picture, on the picture you have, the pixel size is 10 microns. If we want to then
suppose that we took the picture at a 1000x magnification. Right, now we have to go one more step. We can say that in the picture we have a resolution of, what's the resolution? 20 microns. Right, two pixels. If we're working at a 1000x magnification, that means that That means that as the electron beam was sitting on the specimen surface, each pixel is separated from the next one by 10 nanometers. And so in your 1000x image that's printed onto a 10 centimeter um, frame, there's a resolution, provided that the beam itself could provide this, and it should be able to in most cases. This is nearing the limit of many SEMs. But there should be a 20 nanometer resolution. should have a 20 nanometer resolution in that image. Okay. Most of you are working with a faculty member. You're not doing the work entirely on your own. There's something that's called empty magnification. And if we take this case where we suppose that the beam di diameter is 10 nanometers, suppose that we're working right at the limit of the instrument as it's been tuned up. Now, that means that Here, in this example, we've got two pixels that are 20 microns apart. How many of you think you can see 20 microns apart? If any of you say you think you can, I'd like to talk to you. Seriously. Yeah, that doesn't write very well. Your eye can probably resolve about 200 microns at the limit. That's about, right, 0.2 millimeters. Your advisor is older than you. And so if you want to show them the image, you may have to make some adjustments. Now, technically, this is what's referred to as empty magnification. Because now what you're doing is blowing up the picture more than you need to to be able to visualize what's in it. Because technically, you could take this to a microscope and look through a microscope at it, a 10, 20 power microscope, and see all of the separate objects in there. 
But you may not want to give a presentation to a group of 30 to 40 eminent international scholars at the next conference you go to and hand out binoculars for them to see what's in your image, right? At, at $200 a pair, if you get a decent pair of binoculars, that's going to be, what, $600 just to hand out binoculars to the audience. So what you may want to do is enlarge the image even more so that you can make use of the resolution. In general, this is a problem you're not going to run into. Most people tend to take pictures, just take the picture as it is, with empty resolution, if what they're trying to see it is below the resolving power. Most of the images you take will be taken with some empty magnification for this practical reason. The, the only argument against using empty magnification is that if you blow up your image by ten times, If you blow up your image by 10 times, if you take it at 10,000x instead of 1,000x, you're looking at 1% of the area that you were looking at before, right? You've thrown away 99% of the information you had. But if you know exactly which object it is you want to look at and you're not interested in the other ones, then you're not wasting the information you want. Going up in magnification needlessly is throwing away a lot of information. Okay. Let me switch topics a little bit now, and we'll talk about contrast. Contrast is the ability to tell that two adjacent reason, regions are different, by which, let me specify, that what I'm talking about is that they have a different intensity. Now, this could be the intensity in the image, it could be the inten intensity in some other type of signal. It doesn't have to be the signal that you're using to image with. This could be anything. And it turns out that there are two factors to this. One is the relative change between the intensities of those two regions. And the second one is The second one is the intensity relative to the background 
fluctuations, what we commonly refer to as signal to noise. There are numbers that have been given for both of these. For the first one, it's found that people can discriminate pretty well if the relative change in intensity is greater than about 5 percent. Right. So if you want to sit here and try to figure out whether I mean the intensity of the lower intensity one or the intensity of the higher intensity one, remember that I'm talking about 5 percent, so it really doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Am I talking about 5 percent or 5.03 percent? is the difference that we're looking at. And there's an approximate sign. So, no, it doesn't matter. Um, You can run into this problem in dark regions, in gray regions, in very light regions. But when things are very light, the difference in intensity, if we say that the intensity scales from 0 to 1, a difference in intensity of 0.01 at a total intensity of 0.9, right, is not going to work. Whereas in a darker region, the same absolute difference in intensity will work. Let me change that. I can do math sometimes. So in a darker region, a very small change in intensity will work better than it will in a lighter region. second factor, make sure everybody got my mistake down, okay, the second factor, relative to background, it's found that people can discriminate reliably a signal point, an object, for example, if that object is at least five times the noise level. Some of you may have run into this before. So for example, if you're looking for a very weak x-ray diffraction peak or a very weak chemical signal out of, it could be just about anything, um, IR, FTIR, it could be EDS, it could be NMR, whatever. Is, is, this is something you may have run into before where you're trying to figure out is that a peak or is that not a peak? And we can usually rely on it. The standard rule is if the change in intensity is five times the background. And of course,
on an electron micrograph that is in a picture, what you're looking at is this is especially going to be a problem in dark regions. And the reason why is that even if we have both noise and signal, not only is the noise stochastic, that is statistically based, the signal itself is statistically based. Let me give you a quick example of that. We know that if we're getting just signal and no noise signal, if all we're getting is true signal, we'll still have noise. And unlike a photographic camera where you're taking thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of photons in, here, remember, again, we're scanning across. You've got these. The point is sitting at one pixel at one time. And we're getting a signal just from that one pixel. And we're counting indiv individual discrete events. And so N0 might be a number of typically electrons, perhaps X-rays. If you have the right type of detector in there, it could be photons if you're doing something called cathodoluminescence. No, we don't have one of those yet. But you're, you're counting discrete events. And so it's an actual number. then we expect that if, if N0 is how many we expect, so we could calculate with this dose of electrons and with this sort of signal interaction, we should get this many responses. We expect to see that plus or minus its, its own square root. It's a good handy way to approximate a lot of things of this type. This is one you should remember, not just for this. You should remember this for a lot of applications. So, if N0 is small, if N0 was only 100, then we've only got plus or minus 10 counts, right? If N0 is larger, let's say a million, then N is going to be plus or minus 1,000 counts. And so we get a much larger error. We get a much larger variation if we have a much larger signal. But the bigger variation gives us the smaller 
variation, and the smaller variation gives us the bigger variation. Right. So, what's going to happen here is If we have this situation, we're going to mean, that is, where it's dark, this is what I meant by especially in dark or low signal regions. Where we have less signal, we need a much larger variation above the normal need a much larger change to be able to see it because we don't get much contrast. We can't pull the contrast out of the noise. So, I'm going to make one summary statement about contrast and then one summary statement about the two topics for today. One of the things that we'll see is that you will, when you're taking pictures on the SEM, you will do image processing on the spot in taking your picture. And there are ways we can vastly improve the contrast in an image if we have enough signal. You have to do some degree of design when you're using the instrument. You have to do an optimization. You have to decide how good is the resolution I need, how good is the contrast that I need. Because usually if you improve the resolution, you make the contrast worse. If you improve the contrast, you make the resolution worse. And that's because resolution and signal strength usually go in opposite direction. Contrast is all about signal strength. Okay? We'll leave it there for today. <laughs>